You know, I was only four years old and the youngest of five children when we moved to Victoria, Texas from Augusta, Georgia. My mother, Emily, had only grown up a few miles away in Beach Island, South Carolina on a dairy farm. My dad was from Americus, Georgia, and had graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from the finest institution in Alabama, Auburn University. <laughs> War Eagle, no. Anyway, you see my father worked for DuPont at the Savannah River plant, and he had gotten a promotion and a transfer. And with five children, my parents had to take it. My point in telling you this short family history is to say that we had a foundation there in Augusta, surrounded by family and relatives and friends. Just like the verse today suggests you should have, we had it there in Augusta. So we loaded up the station wagon and away we went with every intention to return as soon as we could. And as we turned down Highway 59 from the piney woods of East Texas into the coastal plains towards Victoria, all I could hear underneath my mother's moans were comments like, look how flat it is. <laughs> and the soil looks like black gumbo. Well, there were no red clay hills in Victoria. Julie probably, my sister Julie, probably liked it the least. The first term paper she wrote in English was entitled Vic Toilet. <laughs> we joined the First Baptist Church uh, soon after arriving in Victoria, and that's where we began to build a new foundation. We met our best friends in that church, the Starkeys, the Canabes, the Johnstons, and the Tanners, to name a few. We were in Sunday school and church Every Sunday, listening to Dr. David Slover, I would sit in between my parents and fall asleep on one of their shoulders typically, and I remember being there and feeling comfortable. It wasn't all great. I had a Sunday school teacher in sixth grade, Coach Mike Terrell, stood about six foot six inches tall, looked me right in the eye one day and told me I'd go straight to hell if I was a sinner. I spent the rest of that Sunday school year in the Dairy Queen across the street. <laughs> well, my brother Paul and Julie graduated from high school and moved on to college. Kelly was improving as a golfer, and my brother Bryant and I were getting involved in various things and making friends. And that's when the call came. DuPont asked Dad to go back to Georgia, back home. But my mother and father realized that we had built a new foundation there in Victoria, Texas, and they couldn't leave. They didn't want to believe it, but it was true. So Catherine and I are trying to build that same type of foundation here at Christ Church, except here it's friends like the Archers and the Martinez's and the Velox. Instead of Coach Terrell, it's, it's Stephen Archer, Stands about the same height, by the way. Just as me. Yeah, just as me. Halita Heinrich and Gavin Rogers. Instead of Dr. Slover, it's Patrick, Rob, and Scott. While this beautiful church, its loving members and caring staff, is the basis of our foundation, the question of how do I entrust my family to God isn't that easy. It takes more. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. <clears throat> Through the years, I have swerved on and off that path and continue to today, as I expect they will. But there are a few things that make it easier. First, they need a mother who makes her children her life's work, just as I have. They need parents that love each other just like I had. They need siblings that are best friends just like I have, and I pray that Natalie and Matthew will become. That might take a while. <laughs> they need parents that are encouraging and love them unconditionally. They need more family members than anyone else at any and every sporting event. 
They need to have dinner together each day and pray together each night. They need to be shown forgiveness, taught kindness, and to learn respect. And they need to read the Bible often. So I came across this story the other day that may sum all this up. A Sunday school teacher asked her students, why do you believe in God? Well, one little boy spoke up and answered, I don't know. I guess it runs in the family. (laughs) Well, I wish I had known Matt's um, dad because I too had to resign my job. I had to resign from the ministry in order to entrust my family to God. It was 29 and a half years ago, Kay and I took our first pastoral call to East Texas. Uh, We had been married, I guess, uh, 14 years by that time. It means that Clay was 12, uh, Catherine Grace was about 8, and John was three and a half going on four. We moved from our tiny little hovel there in the mountains of Tennessee to an expansive 4,000 square foot manor in the elite part of town where the church placed us. It was like the Clampets had come to Beverly Hills. We just as easily could have moved to a foreign country for as, as out of place we felt. After the, after the movers... Uh, took our paltry belongings and kind of set them in one corner of that gigantic home, Kay announced that she was going to go to the grocery store to pick up a few things that we might need. And I thought, well, that's the way to go, girl. And so she left, and I was working with the kids, unpacking and so forth. An hour and a half later, Kay came storming back into the house, slammed the groceries down on the kitchen counter, and she said, These people even dress up to go to the grocery store. (laughs) And then she began to prance around the kitchen. They had designer 4th of July t-shirts and matching bows and coordinated socks. She said, who in God's name wears 4th of July socks? (laughs) Well, if my wife not having a Christian Dior uh, t-shirt was funny, The next part of our life uh, there was uh, bordering on tragic. Our two sons, Clay and John, suffered from a very serious childhood asthma. And uh, in the rarefied air of the mountains, we were able to control it. But when we moved to the more tropical uh, area of East Texas, they began to be sick one after the other. And of course, we were at the emergency room every two weeks and always after midnight. And so there, either Clay would be putting his head against my shoulder and, and, or, or I'd be holding little John and they would be coughing incessantly uh, and wheezing and literally gasping for air. And at first, I'd be sad, as most daddies get. You know, I was sad at first. But then I would just get incredibly angry. Angry that I had pulled the rug, pulled the foundation from beneath my family, and I couldn't keep my boys well, and I couldn't get my wife happy. And so I felt um, at loose ends. I felt great despair. Well, if the first thing that happened was comedy and the second tragedy, the third thing that happened was ridiculous. All three of our children attended the Episcopal Day School. Uh, It was a big school, and so Clay was in the middle school area, Catherine Grace in the elementary school, and John in the preschool. One of my auxiliary uh, assignments as the assistant rector was to be the chaplain of that big school. Well, everything was going along swimmingly, I thought. And one day, however, we were summoned for a parent-teacher conference. Not for Clay in middle school, Not for Catherine Grace in elementary school, but for John, who was in preschool. (laughs) I could see the Alabama hackles rising uh, uh, on my wife, Kay McLean Gahan. And she began to say, why in the world would you have a parent-teacher conference called for a preschooler? (laughs) Nevertheless, we put on our Sunday best and went to the little school. 
And when we arrived, we noticed the first year teacher was kind of pacing back and forth across, across the room. The principal was sitting uh, augustly in her chair. And after some initial pleasantries, um, the, um, the, the, little, the teacher said, He, he, John just, he just pees. He pees on the playground. <laughs> And my wife let this kind of settle in for about 20 seconds. And she looked at that young teacher and said, you do know he's four years old, right? <laughs> well, no matter. John was expelled. Yes. All my kids have their graduate degrees. None of them have been expelled except John in preschool for peeing. <clears throat> no. Please don't despair about this. The Baptists took him into their school that very afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Evidently, playing cards uh, and dancing and drinking still a sin, but you can still urinate in that denomination. So, you know. <clears throat> well, the damage was pretty much done. That was those kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I felt the foundation beneath our family just crumbling. The only person that was happy was our daughter, Catherine Grace. She had been chosen to be a junior attendant in the Rose Festival. And so uh, some of the ladies in the congregation had given her this flowing gown. And weeks before the Rose Festival took place, she would glide across the wooden floors of our expansive home and put her hand up to her head and go, Yankees in Georgia, it's the end of the world. <laughs> she was the only one who was happy, however. Um, and so I decided that I must go resign my post. And that was more of a chore than you might know. My boss's name was the Reverend Martin Luther Agnew Jr., he was a two time NCAA football All American, he played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was as big as Coach Terrell at 6'6", and he was probably, at that time, the finest Episcopal priest in the entire country. He was my childhood idol. But nevertheless, my family and I were so miserable, I was so ready to go back to teaching and coaching that I could almost, you know, be lifted off the floor to do so, that I walked in there and said, ML, I'm sorry, but I'm going to resign my post. And for once in his life, this is the only time he didn't get up and act like he was going to strangle me. Um, he said, now, Pat, I want you to think about this. I want you to get your family and go on a long weekend, and I want you to go back up to Tennessee and see if that's really what you want to do. And I said, yes, sir. The parish had given us a car, and so I loaded everyone up. I was practically singing as we went through Louisiana and Alabama, headed up towards Tennessee. I was going to get, we're going to get our old life back. And sure enough, when we arrived back in our hometown, uh, my, my boss immediately offered my job back. Kay, the hospital offered Kay a chance to come right back to her nursing job. The kids saw their old friends. They could go back to their, to their school and, and be contented. But I'll never forget the moment when Kay and I looked at each other and said, this place is shrunk. This is no longer home. This is not where we've been called. And we got back in the car and decided to come back to East Texas to continue in our life. Now, the kids were fine. I mean, the boys, they, their lungs began to develop. And, you know, Clay played two college sports. He played both college football and college basketball. John was captain of all three of his high school sports as a senior, football, basketball, and baseball. So they were fine. Catherine Grace, of course, was ultra uber fine. She eventually made her way as a debutante in southeast Texas in the Neches River Festival and all that stuff. That's why I'm still broke today. Um, <laughs> Kay uh, signed up in the intensive care unit of one of the major hospitals in that city, and she got her footing back. And it was there, it was there that I learned to be a pastor. The only reason I can serve God today, really, that I know how to serve God as a pastor is because of that place and those people and that parish 
in that town. And the only reason why I know how to serve beside you today as your rector is because of my time spent there. The only reason. I know that. You know, Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, at the very ser- end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell and the floods came and the winds beat against that house. But the house did not fall because it was built upon the rock. It's built upon the rock. And I used to think, I used to think that was about you know, just, just minding the instructions of Jesus. Just, you know, making sure that I kept the Ten Commandments in the expansive form that he gave us in the Sermon on the Mount. That I just uh, made sure that I tried to lead my life like Jesus. But now I realize it's much more than that. What Jesus was saying to this man is that if he is truly my Savior, if I entrust him with my life to reconcile me to God, that I can surely trust my family to God. That my children are not mine. My wife is not mine. My job is to give them back to God. Believing that his plan is bigger than the little plans, the little shrunken plans that I have. And that a good family in some ways is like a good university. Where you end up on Ground that is a little uncertain and you're challenged and you're pushed and you're made uncomfortable and you're made into the person, into the woman or the man God has called you to be. Not that I wanted to mold my children and my wife to be. And so we persevered. And it was exactly this time, 29 and a half years ago, when all the women in that town broke out their Oscar de la Renta Halloween t-shirts and it didn't bother my wife one little bit. <laughs>